I'm excited to introduce tonight's guest, who has been called the most consistently thought-provoking TV reporter of our time. John Stossel is with Fox Business Network and is the host of Stossel, a weekly program highlighting current consumer issues with a libertarian viewpoint. Prior to joining Fox Business Network, he co-anchored ABC's 2020. While there, he contributed to in-depth special reports and recurring segments on a variety of consumer topics, from pop culture to government and business. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. John Stossel. Thank you, that's very nice. Uh, and I'll take comments and questions. We have time for that afterward, right? Um, Peter talked about market process, its moral foundation. What is he talking about? Moral foundation, the market? Well, this was my attitude when I was an undergraduate. And when I got my first job as a television reporter, I became a consumer reporter. And that was the attitude I took to that. And I was successful at it. I won 19 Emmy Awards bashing business because my attitude is what I think most of the public's attitude, unless you study economics or are un unusually intuitively able to understand it, that capitalism was okay, brings us some stuff, but it's by and large cruel and unfair. And we need government to protect us from the capitalists. And there were lots of stories I could do along these lines. The, the Coffee Institute was running ads saying, coffee's the drink that picks you up while it calms you down. So we called him up and said, how can you say this? It's contradictory. Well, we have research to back that up. Really, what's the research? Well, we surveyed thousands of people. We asked them, when do you get out of your coffee break? Some people said it picked them up. Some people said it calmed them down. <laughs> Libby Owens Ford Glass Company was running ads saying, look how clear our car window glass is, and they shot them with the windows rolled down. <laughs> so this is why we consumer reporters said you, you gotta have regulation. You have to police these companies to protect the consumer. But then I watched them work. They don't make life better for consumer. They make life more complex. They make things cost more. They consume vast amounts of money. I mean, the least of it is the direct cost, the money they take from all of us in taxes to pay all the bureaucrats. The bigger cost is the indirect cost, all the money and creative energy that's wasted in just trying to understand the rules and game the system. You have some of the smartest undergraduates in America today, you know, with straight A students, many of them want to go to law school. I don't blame them, that's where the action is. But that doesn't make America more prosperous. They don't invent things, create things. All this energy is lost, filling out the forms, lobbying politicians, forming trade associations, hiring the lawyers just to try to understand the rules. What started to turn me around was that I soon saw that all these extra layers didn't even work on the obvious crooks. The people selling the breast enlargers and the penis enlargers and the burned fat while you sleep pills. They kept getting away with it. I mean, sometimes the regulators would come after them and maybe five years into the scam. And then the crook would hire a lawyer who would hold the regulators off for another five years. And then they would just change the name of the product or move to a different jurisdiction, different county, different state. Or they'd lawyer up and they'd sign a consent order. Consent orders where you say, we don't admit doing anything wrong, but we won't do it anymore. <laughs> By contrast, the more I watched market competition work, the more I saw that, gee, it was solving these problems better than the heavy hand of government. I mean, it wasn't perfect. There were Enrons and WorldComs and Bernie Madoffs. But what was remarkable in a $14 trillion economy is how rare they were. They're on the front page because they don't happen very often. Compare it to government where, I mean, it doesn't happen often because when you cheat, you don't get rich in America 
rip it off your customers. The people who get really rich, the Bill Gateses of the world, get rich by offering customers something we like. Compare that to government. Um, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs lo lost $3 billion of the Indians' money, did they go out of business? No, they just go back to Congress and say, oops, oops, we need another $3 billion, and Congress gives it to them. The businesses that don't serve their customers well go out of business. And I soon saw it as a consumer reporter, because when I was a local reporter in Portland, Oregon, and in New York City, I found lots of scams I could do night after night. But when I got to the network, to 2020 and Good Morning America, it was tougher to find scams worthy of a national audience. Why? Because they don't get big. Because the bad companies atrophy while the good ones thrive. The market, I soon saw, will protect us far better than government ever will. Now, more recently, we're told by both parties, by both the Bush and Obama administration, that the market will not self-police, that the current economic crisis demonstrates that, that the banks took unreasonable risks, and they now have to move in to intervene to protect the, protect the consumer with the bailouts and new regulations, because it's a crisis. Well, I have to wonder about that. There was a Wall Street Journal headline on a Russ Roberts story that was titled, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. <laughs> he argued that you didn't have to do anything, but the Treasury secretaries both said, no, we have to act because there's a credit freeze. This is going to lead to a horrible depression. And I can understand Bernanke's fear of that. He's a student of the Depression, and during the Depression, credit froze. People pulled their money out of banks, and it didn't recover. But that was in the 1930s. Life is different now. Now we have the Internet. So are you telling me that if you invent the wheel today, and all the, every bank were out of business, that rich people wouldn't find you to lend you money in some form, PayPal for all I know, that there wouldn't be some new mechanism that would emerge that would replace these irresponsible banks. I think they should have let them go out of business. They're not too big to fail. <laughs> what if the government had cut Fannie and Freddie and Bear Stearns and all of the others loose to force businesses to do what all businesses do when they fall upon hard times. Revalue their assets, renegotiate with creditors. Telling me the market wouldn't have sorted it out? We'll never know, because they didn't let it happen. I think prices would have found a more solid floor. But our leaders were panicked. It was a crisis, they said. But why was it a crisis? Now we say this is a crisis because look how high unemployment is. And that truly is horrible for the people who are unemployed and the people who depend on them. But how high is unemployment now? Or how high did it get this past year compared to what it was in 1982? Anybody remember how un unemployment was then? What? what? It rose to 10.8%. Most people don't even remember that. We never got that high this time. Well, the stock market crashed. Yeah, so what? It was down 25%. It's called their, their boom, we had a bubble, it popped. Now it's at 10,000, way down from its peak. Is that a crisis? Anybody here remember what the stock, what the Dow was in 82? Want to guess at that? What's your guess? What was it in 80, 1982? It's 10,000 now. I'm hearing 8,000, somebody, 3,000, somebody said this. Somebody got it here. 800, 780 actually. So in 25 years, it went from 780 to 10,000. And we're calling that a crisis. I mean, had it happened steadily, instead of going up to 14,000 and back down to 10,000, we'd say this was one of the greatest extended periods of prosperity that any nation has ever had in the history of the world. I mean, this isn't a crisis. The 
soldiers freezing during the Revolutionary War when the British were coming, or the Civil War, or Black Plague. That's, those were crises. Now we call a bubble popping a crisis. I call it a correction. But the media is always saying it's a crisis because, hey, it helps us get more viewers or sell more newspapers. Global warming, we're told, is a crisis. Healthcare is now a crisis. We forget the old crises. There's just one after the other. But remember Y2K, the year 2000? All the computers were going to crash. The planes were going to go down. Then came bird flu, swine flu, mad cow disease. Stopped everybody from eating meat for maybe a week. <laughs> the pesticide residues were giving everybody cancer. They were causing America's cancer epidemic. That was a lie. It's the press's bad reporting. There is no cancer epidemic. Cancer rates are flat. We're just living long enough to get cancer now. Um, how about the killer bees coming up from Mexico? They were going to sting us all to death. Remember them? <laughs> so now it's a financial crisis in health care. The people closest to the problem are the ones who panic most. It's the bird flu specialists who are most panicked about how we have to protect ourselves from bird flu. And who is closest to the financial crisis? Well, people like Hank Paulson. And he was getting calls every second from all his former buddies at Goldman Sachs saying, oh my god, it's terrible, you got to do something. And he had the power to do something. He had the power to spend billions of your dollars. A few men had the power to spend all that phenomenal amount of money. So now we have the crisis and Senator Dodd has his new financial regulation bill that's uh, it's going to make things worse. Frederick Hayek said, regulation and government control is the path to stagnation and poverty. Markets are too complicated for planners to know enough to plan them. And he's absolutely right. That's why the free market does it better. We do need protection from reckless business people, but there's only one way to provide that, and that is free competition. That provides market discipline, but that means no privileges, no crony capitalism, and no bailouts. We don't have that. Now, this is not intuitive, as I mentioned. Maybe some of you get it because you're studying business and economics. I didn't get it. It took me years to have some idea about this. Because your instinct is to say, you know, maybe this works for trivial stuff, but by and large, life is too complex for the unregulated market to handle. Take things like health care. I, I can't decide which doctor's better, which treatment works. The snake oil sellers will poison me. Or education. They say government has to run the K through 12 education system because the parents aren't qualified to decide which teacher is better, what curricula are better. And this is intuitive. But it's nonsense. It's, it's lack of understanding of markets. Because as an example, consider cars. Cars are certainly just as complicated as health care. I mean, I sure don't understand what makes one car safer than another or run better than another. I'm no automotive engineer. And yet, consider the worst car you can buy here in South Carolina and compare it to the best the experts could produce. And that was this car. <laughs> now this was produced, this is the Trabant. It was produced by the East Germans. No slouches, those guys. These were Germans, you know, they're rocket scientists. And yet this was the best they could do. Uh, it was such a bad car that you had to put the oil and gas in separately and shake the car to mix them together. <laughs> and it was the pride of the Eastern Bloc, it and the Hugo. And yet when the Berlin Wall went down, the Trabant disappeared. Why? Why could their best not compete with our mediocre product? Because not everybody has to be an expert for the free, free market to work its magic. You just need a few people, a few car buffs, or a few consumers who read the car magazines. And through word of mouth, the good and bad news spread. The good companies thrive, the bad ones atrophy. Free markets will protect the ignorant, too. 
I'm not saying the market will take care of everything. We need government. We need some government, limited government. That was the genius of the founders. We need rule of law. We need government to keep us safe, protect our private property. I mean, the worst places to live are the places where there isn't enough government. Uh, African country where nobody will build a factory because you're afraid your neighbor will just steal what you make or the dictator may take your whole factory. So we need government to protect personal safety and property and to impose some pollution rules, I'd add that. But beyond that, how much government do we need? What percent of the economy should government be? We rarely ask it in those terms, uh, but when I do, people tend to say, well, maybe 10% of the economy, maybe 12%. But what's happened over the course of America? Here, here's a graph of the growth of government since the republic began. For most of the history of America, government was less than 5% of GDP. It starts to go up during World War II. Um, and then Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society is when the line starts going straight up. And this is even before Obama, so the line has gone up sharply more ever since. Now, government, if you include state and local, is about 40% of the economy. It's not costing the, not including the cost of the regulations. Here it is adjusted for population growth. I mean, this is insane. This is hubris. They keep expanding it. They know better. They pass I'll just give one example, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Well, we need this to keep the workers safe because these factories, they don't care if they kill their workers. Actually, they do because then they have to spend money to retrain other workers. I mean, even that is enough to deter them, but the politicians don't get that. So the head of OSHA was uh, under uh, President Clinton, Charles Jeffries, was proud of going around and speaking. He'd hold up a chart to show how workplace injuries had dropped since OSHA was created. And it was impressive. They had dropped. But then some researchers went back to the time before OSHA was created and charted that, and here it is. <laughs> I mean, government is like someone who jumps in front of a parade and claims to be leading the parade. In a free society, things get better. I mean, workers get smarter. The companies don't want to kill their workers and retrain people. They get smarter. As we get richer, we can afford new safety devices. Things get better if we leave people alone. But the politicians don't get that. I mean, they spend money, I would say, like drunken sailors, but that insults the drunken sailors because they spend their own money. <laughs> Some of you watched one of the shows I have done and, and offered a classroom called Is America Number One? That's actually my favorite more than Stossel Goes to Washington, where you talk about what makes a society prosperous. And when I say to high school kids, why is America prosperous when most of the world live miserable, impoverished lives? And they say, well, it's because we're a democracy. And because we're a relatively new country, we have lots of natural resources. And that's true, and those things have helped. But then I say, well, India's a democracy and has lots of resources, but India's poor. And they say, well, India's overpopulated. But actually, the population density of India is the same as that of New Jersey, and it's actually less than that of Holland, and those places are doing okay. And what about Hong Kong? Hong Kong has no resources. It's just a rock and no democracy. It has the communist Chinese now. It had the British rulers before that. But Hong Kong, in 50 years, went from third world to first world. They got rich. They're as rich as we are. What did they have? They had economic freedom. The British rulers enforced rule of law, kept people from stealing from each other or hurting each other. And then they sat around and drank tea. They left free people alone, and that allowed them to make themselves rich. Economic freedom is the most important thing, but 
Again, people don't get that. In fact, in the media, every newsroom I've been in, people hate business. Suspicious, you greedy business people supporting a business school, business education. I mean, at first I thought it was envy of the wealth because the college professor is envious that his slightly stupider roommate is now in business and making more money than he is. But then I thought about the kings and queens of old Europe, and they were vastly richer than the average person, yet they weren't hated, they were revered. But people hated the bourgeoisie, they gave them that nasty name. They hated the very people who sold them the things they needed to make their lives better. I'm trying to understand what's that about? And the best answer I can come up with is that People think of life as a zero-sum game. So if some guy's making a profit, I must have lost something. I must have gotten ripped off. And I see why politicians think that way and lawyers think that way, because their world does work that way. If somebody wins, somebody else has to lose. But business doesn't work that way, because business is voluntary, if you don't have crony capitalism. And there are only two ways to do things in life, forced or voluntary. Government is force, and as I said, we need some force, but because business is voluntary, it doesn't happen unless both parties feel they've gained something for the transaction. Otherwise, the transaction doesn't get made. It's why you have this weird double thank you moment if you buy something. You buy a cup of coffee, you give her the buck, she gives you the coffee, say, thank you, thank you. <laughs> why do you both say thank you? <laughs> because you wanted the coffee more than you wanted the buck. She wanted the buck more than she wanted the coffee. <laughs> business is win-win or it doesn't happen. So it's not like there's this pie and Bill Gates takes a big piece and we have less. No, entrepreneurs like him bake thousands of new pies. They make us all richer. But reporters and politicians don't get that. We take capitalism for granted. Capitalism has lifted more people out of the mud and misery of stoop labor than any system ever. But we sneer at it. We don't think about its miracles. We just accept them. We accept the fact that a supermarket has 30,000 products and is open all the time, and the food rarely poisons us. It works. Government couldn't do that. We accept the fact that I can go to a foreign country, stick a piece of plastic in the wall, and cash will come out. And I can give the same piece of plastic to a total stranger and he'll rent me a car for a week. A guy who doesn't even speak English. And when I get home, Visa or MasterCard will have the accounting correct to the penny. We accept that. But the government can't even count the votes correctly. <laughs> and now government's going to run health care? I don't think so. I hope you fight for the liberty that made America great. Thank you very much. I think you'd agree that our income tax code makes our businesses and our economy less competitive. Do you support replacing our income tax code with a fair tax? Well, a consumption tax is certainly better than an income tax. Uh, I think if the fair tax is, and I just read this attack on it in the National Review, pointing out that a lot of the claims made for the fair tax are pie in the sky, I think. And at 30%, which it would have to be, there'd be a lot of cheating on the fair tax, too. Uh, I would prefer some form of simple flat tax that was lower, but to get there, we first need government to spend a lot less money. I am going to do a show on April 15th, uh, and we will have Neil Bortz on and do a segment on the fair tax and let him answer those questions. Um, she asked, and why don't you go to the other mic because it looks like this one isn't working. Uh, she asked, what can people do to protect our liberties? Uh, 
it's hard to know what to do. It's part of the Tea Party movement, actually, that people show up and they're angry at all, and then what do they do? They mill around and share their anger, which is nice, but I'm not sure what it solves. Uh, my best attempt at doing something has been this Stossel in the Classroom charity that I buy my videos from ABC, and Fox is nicer about it. They'll give them to me and give them to teachers to try to educate people. It's hard to know what to do. Thomas Jefferson said, it's the natural progress of things for government to grow and liberty to yield. I mean, it's what's happened in every society in history. It's, it, it, freedom is not a natural state. All I can say in answer to this good question is, we ought to talk about liberty and remember that the natural intuition is always to say, there ought to be a law. And there are always more laws. They almost never repeal the old ones while they pass new ones. Yes, ma'am. Speaking about government and liberty, what's your opinion of the war on drugs? The war on drugs, I think, is a, a horrible intrusion on liberty. And I mean, forgive me for a, a long answer. And when did you guys go to that mic? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> It was working? Well, if you can make it work, but otherwise go to that one, because I have a long answer here. All right, it's a complicated answer, because this is a conservative part of the country, and here I'm a libertarian saying there shouldn't be laws against drugs. What, you want the kids to take drugs? How immoral? My point is that, you know, cruelty is immoral too, but we don't try to make it illegal. This law isn't working. I have young kids. My instinct is to say, good, I'm glad this stuff is illegal. They can't zip down to the neighborhood pharmacy and go get high. Maybe this will deter them. But I have no evidence that it does deter them. I mean, sometimes making things illegal makes them more appealing to kids. And you students know the drugs are as easy to get as alcohol. Making them illegal doesn't make them unavailable. We can't even keep the stuff out of prisons. So I don't know how we're going to keep it out of America. <laughs> So I'm not sure what drug prohibition has accomplished, but I do now know what the unintended consequences of the law are, because now I can see them. And as with all regulation, the unintended consequences are far worse than the problem. And I'll just list some of it. First, there's the drug crime. Almost none of it is because of the drug. People rarely get high and therefore commit crimes. Maybe some meth addicts or something. But the government says heroin and nicotine are equally addictive. Nobody's knocking over 7-Elevens to get Marlboros. It's the law that causes the crime because it creates the black market. The sellers can't rely on the cops to protect their private property, so they arm themselves and form gangs. And the buyers steal to pay the high prices. It's the law that causes the crime. Um, we, we forget that Al Capone was created by alcohol prohibition. The gangs we're creating now are, are even richer. We're corrupting police forces. We're corrupting whole countries like Mexico with this attempt at prohibition. Prohibition doesn't work. As libertarian, I would argue that once you're an adult, consenting adults ought to be able to do whatever they want with their own bodies. Um, including taking drugs. And also, they're not as bad as people say, because if you look at the numbers, like crack, I've been convinced that crack was a special drug. You took it once, you were hooked forever. But if you look at the government's own data, they say there are something like 300,000 current crack users, and 12 million people have tried crack. So think about it. Most of them gave it up. <laughs> A few of them died, but most of them <laughs> gave it up on their own without a government-funded rehab program to help them through it. The drug war is far worse than the drugs. Sorry for the long answer. Yes, ma'am. That's all right. Um, you used the term crony capitalism several times, and I was just wondering what exactly you meant, like the definition of that. Well, I used it several times because Peter said he wanted me to talk about crony capitalism, so. <laughs> People vilify capitalism because of its special privileges or of the banks that got bailed out. But that's not capitalism. Capitalism is the opportunity to succeed or fail. If you use your friends in government, your connections in high places 
to give you either special advantage or to keep you from failing, that's crony capitalism, and that's about as bad as socialism. And we've got plenty of that. We have corporate welfare. We have tax money being spent to help exports because we want to have exports. But what that means is instead of companies competing on a level playing field, they invested lobbyists who try to suck up to this senator who gets them the special privilege for their export. Real capitalism is limited government, the same rules for everybody. Yes, sir. Um, I recently saw your uh, Stossel episode on um, Ayn Rand's Alice Shrugged. A uh, big fan of the book myself and the economic kind of objectivism that it proposes. But um, in your opinion, is the U.S. economy and then kind of the economy that it affects throughout the world, is it heading more towards a world of the moochers or an idyllic place like uh, Gulch Gulch? So this is based on in my new Fox Business show, which I'm so glad you get because not everybody has the channel uh, to start up. Um, it's on the internet. It's on the internet, okay, that's true. It was actually a reason that I was willing to leave ABC, because now this stuff goes out on YouTube, million formats. We did a show on Atlas Shrugged, and Atlas Shrugged was written 50 years ago by this Russian woman who, create, who describes a world where the producers are, are just smothered by increasing government, and by the head bureaucrat is Wesley Mooch, the moocher you referred to. And yes, I think this is what America is becoming. And as I, if you read the book now, now that I am smarter, I read, I read it as when I was your age, I read, didn't register much, but now that I've become a consumer reporter, watch the stuff happening, it's like, oh my God, how could she, 50 years ago have known this. She's describing exactly the sanctimony about, a, oh, we have to protect you from the evil capitalists. And all these good sounding rules, the Unfair Competition Act, and uh, that's the kind of stuff that's being done by the current Congress. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I had a, one quick question. You say that economic freedom is the best thing, but currently as a 20-year-old, I am not allowed to get a credit card without my parents co-signing. Do you agree or disagree with the new credit card regulations? But is that, the, is that a new law or? It's, it's recently passed. It's supposed to protect you from yourself. Yes. Well, <laughs> no, I, I don't think there should be laws like that any more than you know, years ago, there were laws that would say, well, you can't have a credit card because you're not white. And after that, you couldn't have had a credit card because you're a woman, unless your husband gave permission. So no, the, none of these laws are good. And if, if some businesses, let's say a business was racist or sexist or foolishly against youth, in a free society, the market sorts that out. Because the business that says 20-year-olds, no, we're not going to give them credit cards. Uh, if enough 20-year-olds pay their bills, then the business that doesn't sell to 20-year-olds goes out of business. The business that discriminates against women goes out of business because the one that hires women has better employees and so on. The market solves these problems better than government ever will. And I'm sorry to hear that there's this new law. But it's to protect you. <laughs> Yeah, John, thanks again also for being here. One thing that I think all of us have in common here coming to the midterm election is we all have a vote. Are you, you the guy who goes to all the council meetings? I go to all the council meetings, absolutely. Yeah, okay. No, I'm not. I'm, I actually live in Atlanta where Neil Board says, and it relates to what he uh, says about libertarianism. We all call ourselves, a lot of us call ourselves that, but when we get to the midterm election, we don't like what's going on. We just go vote for the other side. Should we, at this midterm election, decide to go libertarian? Or is, and is that a waste to vote if we do? I, I couldn't hear. At this midterm election, decide to what? Go libertarian, <laughs> knowing that it may be a waste to vote, or just go vote for the other side. I mean, I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do. I, I waste my vote on the libertarian candidate every year. Uh. <laughs> Maybe this year there'll be some wonderful limited government Democrat or Republican you can vote for. I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I had big hopes for your governor, actually. He was one of the few libertarians around. <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say um, 
I realize there may be some controversy with this uh, question or topic. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> however, um, how far do you think we would have uh, dived, nosedived, without government intervention? I agree with you 100%. Government is not efficient. However, what happens to the people that don't have three to six months of savings in the bank? The majority of uh, Americans don't have the type of cushion to just live off of, send their kids to college, pay for their, their, their residences. What happens to those people if, I agree, in the long run, the market would correct itself, but what happens in that interim period and how long does it last? I don't know. And, but first of all, it's not going to happen. We're not just going to get, I, in my ideal world, it would happen, but. In the real world, it's not going to happen. If it did happen, there would be a, a very tough transition time. And it's hard to say that in the long run, we'll all be better off, but all these people have to suffer now. I used to have fights with my wife about this. She'd ask that, make that same point. But we forget, once government steps in and takes over a function, we forget what the alternatives might have been. So take welfare. What are we going to do for all those people who don't save, who need food stamps, who the children of the irresponsible parents, you're going to throw them out on the street? So two points. One, when there was welfare reform, people said you're going to have chaos in the streets like you haven't seen since the days of the bubonic plague. It didn't happen. The other point is that before there was a big government safety net, there were all over America things called mutual aid societies. Now, they were racist. They tended to be blacks helping blacks, Koreans helping Koreans, but they were little community groups of people who helped their kind. And they were better at it than government because they knew better than the bureaucracy who needed a handout and who needed a kick in the rear. But people said, we need to do more. Then you create a multi-billion dollar welfare bureaucracy and people say, well, I don't need to do it. That's the government's job. Yes, there would be suffering. I can't imagine what it would be like any more than I can imagine what, would, what the suffering would have been if they hadn't bailed out these institutions. But I know that we would have found a more solid floor to have a real self reliant society that would grow on after that. Thank you. Hi, this yes. question isn't about the uh, free market or freedom per se, but um, and it, there, it might be a flawed question because people with moral courage often don't see any alternative. So you, you may not have an answer to this. But I think from our perspective, you seem to have a lot of moral courage because you went against the stream. And I'm sure it was pretty difficult in your field to have such an unusual view. Do you have any explanation for how you got that way? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I'm not sure how I became a libertarian from when no one else in my field is or how I had the courage to the courage. fight my peers. Uh, I mean, I don't think it takes much courage. Nobody's shooting at me. If you think about the courage it took to fight the British, that was courage because they were trying to kill you. I had somebody come up to me in the street in New York and say, are you John Stossel? Yes. I hope you die soon. <laughs> And it's true, it's been sort of ugly. I won 19 Emmys when I was a leftist criticizing business, and I haven't won a single one since. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's unpleasant. And, and yet, I had studied up on this and discovered Reason Magazine and saw the error of my ways, and it's kind of like I'm a, a born-again libertarian. I'm passionate about this, and even though my peers at ABC didn't want me to do it, I was commercially successful, so they kept me on. They wouldn't have allowed me to do the specials I did, except I, the free market worked, and I got another job offer. And I said, I'm taking this offer unless you let me do these, and they reluctantly let me do it, and they were surprised when they rated well. Um, but I didn't think I had to have that much moral courage to do it. But one more example, Pete, the late Peter Jennings, when he would see me in the hall of ABC, would do one of these. He'd see me and he'd go, 
you. <laughs> because I had betrayed the objectivity of ABC. <laughs> and they wouldn't, wouldn't put me on Nightline or the news program. I just had my little that niche for that icky conservative. And, I mean, they would call me a conservative, even though I'm a libertarian and I hold some beliefs conservatives abhor. Uh, there are no real conservatives in the mainstream media. I mean, conservatives in, to be a conservative in New York where I live is like being a child molester. It's just <laughs> awful. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stossel, first I'd like to thank you for coming to Fox because I can watch you now. I couldn't watch, <laughs> look at you on ABC News. That's true. I couldn't stand watching ABC <laughs> anymore either, frankly. <laughs> 2020 seems to be nonstop <laughs> celebrities and sex murders now. <laughs> and of the news. next thing you're talking about the laws that we're trying to pass and putting pressure on it. I'm 72 years old. When TV first started in Charleston, we watched it, we saw the commercials, and you knew they weren't true. So now the government comes out, truth in advertising. Now people think everything that's said on TV is supposed to be the truth, and it's all lies, you know? It's a, anyway, that's- Well, I don't believe they were all truthful when you were first watching No, no I, it wasn't truthful. We, we knew it wasn't truthful. Ah, you know? now people we, assume we watched, the government's protecting us. Yeah. Right. Uh, like you had the wrestling matches back then. That's all they had almost, a boxing match. And you knew they were fake. You saw shows and you knew they were make-believe. But now you're supposed to, oh, Lord, the government's up here protecting us. Everything's got to be true, you know. <laughs> <laughs> As a libertarian, I'm interested in your opinion on the nation building that um, we've been going through over the last eight years or so in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the um, tremendous amount of resources that the taxpayer, the government, crony uh, capitalism, as you called it, comes to play in what we're doing overseas. And really, as a libertarian, are we really helping the liberty of other people, or are we forcing something on them, which you said yourself is not part of uh, your philosophy? Well, I don't think crony capitalism is a reason we went to Iraq. Bush is a cue, we're doing it for the oil and right. connections. Uh, that hasn't happened. Americans haven't gotten the oil business. And I think the Bush administration went in because they genuinely believe there are slave societies and freedom societies and we with our example and our rule of law could make the Middle East better. I mean, and some people here believe that. I would say maybe a fourth of the libertarians believe it. We're gonna do a show in a few weeks called What is a Libertarian? And one of the four panelists is pro-Iraq. Uh, I think most of us say, we suck at this. And by having our troops in these other countries, we make people hate us. Nation building doesn't work. Ron Paul took heat for saying one of the reasons for 9-11 is that we were occupying Saudi Arabia, which we really aren't, but we have troops there. Uh, that does add to the hatred. I don't think it was the reason for 9-11. Um, we now have troops in dozens of countries. We've got 60,000 troops in Germany still, 30,000 in Italy. I mean, why are we still fighting? We won World War II already, <laughs> and we won the Cold War. Um, I, well, it is 120 countries, but most of those countries are, they have like eight soldiers and they're guarding an embassy or something, and that, so I don't, I used to say 120 countries, and just this week I learned that in most of those countries it's just a few, so I don't think it's a fair comparison. But we have troops in too many places. We're spending now, even under Obama, the Democrats say they'll cut defense spending, but they don't. Defense spending has grown as, uh, it's maybe, it hasn't grown as fast as GDP, but it's up to 750 billion or so now. I, I don't think we are very successful. I think we should be more humble in our foreign policy.
But I should also add, it's not my area of expertise, and I respect those of you who disagree. Yes, sir. Yes, um, after hearing your speech and everything, kind of what I got from it was like, that you're saying that like government's almost become like this, it's like the crutch for people. Like they feel like, like you were saying with the big business and everything, like when they find trouble and everything, instead of like letting what the market should do is let them go out of business, it's like, oh, it's kind of like, here's that crutch and like picks them back up and it screws up the market. So is that what you're really trying to get at? Yes. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> I've never been in one of these speeches. Good, I'm glad it, uh, I mean, just to amplify it, and then we take these last two questions and I'll go out and sign some books, but this built the country. This is the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution together. It's this thin. And this is what created the prosperity that we have. But we keep adding on. Now we have 60,000 pages of tax code and its explanations alone. It, you know, some of it makes life better, but most of it does not. Yes, sir. John, thanks for being here. Uh, I read in the uh, news today or yesterday that for the first time, Social Security is now paying out uh, more money than it's taking in. And I know we have a lot of young people here today who pretty soon when they're in the workforce, they'll be paying between them and their employers 8 or 9% of their income into the Social Security Trust Fund. Um, what is the difference between the Social Security Trust Fund and a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost like I paid this guy to be here because <laughs> it just so happens that 11 o'clock on my program on I, the I Fox Business Network is about this. <laughs> we taped it last week. And I, 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 the only place I disagree is it's wrong to single out Social Security because it's Social Security and Medicare. And Medicare is the bigger Ponzi scheme. And, why did Bernie Madoff, why was Bernie Madoff a vilified crook who we locked up? Well, he took money from people, said we're investing it for your future, but he actually spent it all right then, either on himself or on the smart investors who cashed out early. It's exactly what Social Security and Medicare are. They say the money is going into a trust fund, and you see it in your check, deducted, and you have your account. But there is no money in the trust fund. The politicians spent it that year on current retirees, plus wars and welfare and all the things that the politicians spend money on. And that worked at the beginning, because when Social Security passed, most people didn't even live to age 65. When Medicare passed, there were still about five workers to pay for every one retiree. Now there are three. And when my generation retires, there'll only be two. And as you say, the numbers make no sense. The young people would have to pay 80, 90% taxes. Or they'll have to cut benefits, which I don't think they have the courage to do. So they'll probably just print more money and destroy the currency. And they'll pay you 1000 bucks, but it'll only buy a loaf of bread. I don't know what'll happen. Something's going to break. The one bit of optimism in tonight's program uh, is from an author who talks about how other countries have it worse, like Japan, Germany, they have a lower birth rate. We have a birth rate of 2.1 per couple, 2.1 children. In Japan, it's 1.2, Germany, 1.6. So they have even fewer young people to pay for all the retirees. Maybe we will learn from their disaster and have the courage to address these coming crises. But so far, we haven't. We've just created an entire new entitlement. Um, Last question, thanks. All right, um, thinking about the war on terrorism, what would you say is the proper balance between liberty and security? Well, that's a political question that we have to argue out, but you know, it's the old saying, if you don't, you can give up, what is it, you give up liberty, you have neither liberty nor security, is what they said when the Patriot Act was passed. I mean, we are too scared about things in terms of security. We're so scared about terrorism. But if September 11th happened every year, it would be fewer deaths than we have every half year in house fires. And we're not panicked about house fires. We buy a smoke detector. Um, you know, I, it's hard to, it's, boy, that's a tough question to end on. But uh, it, it, immigration is the question 
in a way related to this. And America was built by immigrants. We libertarians say we ought to let everybody in, but you can't let everybody in when there's a group of fanatics who want to kill us. Uh, I fear we have gone too far in airport security and spending all this money in homeland security on going into Iraq to look for weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it is a threat to our liberty. I think just big government and entitlements and expanded nanny state mini regulation is an even bigger threat because government keeps growing. So thank you for fighting for liberty. I'll go in the back. I love you. <laughs> she does. <laughs> Good for her.